The labor theory of value argues that the economic value of a good or service is determined by the total amount of socially necessary labor required to produce it, as opposed to supply and demand. If we assume its validity, the labor theory of value, or LTV for short, reaches a major conclusion, and that is the only source of profit comes from the exploitation of either the worker or the owner. In other words, there are only two possible outcomes. Either both worker and owner are no better or worse off than they were before they made the transaction, or that one of them is better off and the other is worse off. I imagine Marxists think it looks something like this. There can be only one! But what if both parties were better off because of their relationship? If that were the case, wouldn't both of them be making a profit? Uh, the short answer is yes, they would both be making a profit, and that is indeed how it often works. Profit is easy to understand from the capitalist side. I invest X amount of money, and eventually I get Y amount of money back. If Y is greater than X, I've made some profit. They trade money now for money later. Now, we also need to consider economic depreciation, but that's a different video. So what about from the worker's point of view? How do we know if a worker has made profit? Well, the answer is opportunity cost. When you're looking for a job, no doubt you will try to find the best job for you, or the job that brings you the most utility overall. And utility can be many things. It's subjective. Maybe utility for you is stable working hours, so you can get to see your family every night. Maybe you just like working outside, so you're willing to take a pay cut to do that. Maybe you're just a green fiend, and all that matters to you is how much money you're going to make from your job. It doesn't really matter. Utility is unique to each individual. If you found a job that is best for you, then we can safely assume that there were other offers that you turned down in favor of that opportunity. McDonald's is always hiring after all. The difference in utility between these two offers is a form of profit. Also consider that if the worker will only make a trade that is at least even for himself, and ideally preferable, why would anyone work for capitalists if they could benefit from the entirety of their labor by being self-employed or working in a commune? If the inherent value of my labor is worth $100, but I only get $90 by working for a capitalist, why would I make this trade if better offers exist? One of the most common Marxist arguments seems to be that the capitalist has an unfair advantage over the worker. And they have this advantage because... reasons? I, I'm not actually sure what the advantage is supposed to come from. Uh, but nevertheless, this idea is quite prolific among Marxists, so we need to address it. In a competitive market, we know that everyone is a price taker, meaning that no individual has enough market power to distort prices without the consent of the other actors. The price level is set by many things, but basically it can be boiled down to a supply and demand curve. For anyone who doesn't know, this is a very basic supply and demand curve. Uh, I've got price on the vertical axis quantity on the horizontal and upward sloping demand curve, so excuse me, upward sloping supply curve, but I won't be letting a definition argue for me. So let's look at why everyone is a price taker in a market. In a free market, the capitalist makes money by combining his capital, or means, with the labor of his workers, who he must pay. Basically, he takes one form of capital and adds it to other thing he bought with capital. The capitalist's job is to find the best combination of his capital and purchasable labor to combine so that he can make the most money for the lowest cost. So his incentive is to pay the least for capital and labor. The worker, on the other hand, is a completely different set of incentives. The worker agrees to sell his or her labor to the capitalist for a price that they both agree on, and his incentive is very clear. He wants to trade his labor for as much capital as possible. These competing incentives result in a system that forces both worker and owner to be price takers. If the owner or capitalist is not willing to pay proper wages, his potential workforce will simply work for other capitalists who are willing to pay market wages. On the other hand, if a worker is only willing to work for more than market rate, then his potential employers will hire others who are willing to work for market set wages instead. Competition between workers for jobs and between capitalists for labor is also a major source of protection for both classes. If I have a job that you want, and you are able to do a better job than me for the same price, or you're able to do the same job for less pay, then it's likely that my employer will be willing to replace my labor with yours, at my expense. If I want to keep this job, then I either need to become more efficient, or I'll have to accept lower pay. 
Competition between workers for jobs and between capitalists for labor is also a major source of protection for both classes. If I have a job that you want and you are able to do a better job than me for the same price or the same job for less, then it's likely that my current employ employer will be willing to replace my labor with yours at my expense. If I want to keep this job, then I need to become more efficient or accept lower pay. We must also consider the fact that by working together, employers and workers both enhance what the other has. A capitalist without any labor to combine with his capital will not be able to make very much money. All the cash in the world doesn't do you any good if you have nowhere to grow it. Similarly, the worker's addition, his labor, is also enhanced by the capitalist's input means. If you were to try to make a car right now with only the things that you own, how far would you get? I'm guessing about nowhere. Even if you had the knowledge needed to make the car, where would you get the resources? What about the machines or tools that you need? Where would you sell this car? These questions are all answered by the capitalist. He purchases all the parts, pays the rent and power bill, and finds the buyer. By doing all of these things, the capitalist allows the worker to concentrate on one thing, his job. And in doing so, the worker can become very good at their job. Once a worker increases his or her output, they also increase the value of his or her labor, and ultimately, their income. In truth, the relationship between worker and owner is a symbiotic one in which both parties are better off than they would be without working together. The final product the two join together to make is greater than the sum of its parts, meaning that there is room for both parties to make profit. One of the largest issues with the labor theory of value is its ignorance of the Pareto principle, which states that in a market, the square root of workers will produce about half of the value. So if there are 100 workers, 10 of them will produce half the value. If there are 10,000 workers, 100 of them will be producing half the value. Basically, not everyone is equal. Some people are more productive than others, just like some people are taller or faster than others. This inequality applies to basically everything in life. Only a very small percentage of actors make it into actual Hollywood movies. Only a small percentage of athletes become professional players, and only a small percentage of StarCraft II commoners ever get to cast BlizzCon. Sad. So, if these inequalities do exist, which they most certainly do, why would we assume that the best method for planning a business is by collective decision making? Why wouldn't we want to specialize labor as much as possible, which includes leaving executive decisions to the people who are best at making them? Finally, we must talk about what the labor theory of value has mostly been replaced with, the subjective theory of value. In this model, the value of a good or service is completely separate from how much it costs to produce. The cost of production must still be factored in how much is charged for an item, but as far as determining its real value, it is irrelevant. In the subjective theory of value, the only thing that determines value is demand and nothing else. Are you willing to pay $100 for an Xbox? Probably. I know I'd take that trade. What about $200? Or $500? What about $1,000? Somewhere in there, you probably started saying no. And that is because, to you, an Xbox is not worth more than a certain amount of money. But that is subjective. If Microsoft wants to sell you an Xbox, their job is to get the market value of an Xbox at least as low as whatever subjective value you attribute to it. This means that, in the end, it is the firm's incentive to make their products as cheap as possible. Not only so that you will be more likely to purchase their products over competitors, but also so that they can get the price of their product lower than its subjective value for as many different people as possible. Well, that's it for this one. If you want to see more content like this in the future, go ahead and sub. And if you've got any feedback or suggestions, please do leave a comment. That's about all for me. Peace.